So this is a uh, an NMR interpretation overview video where I want to review some of the NMR interpretation skills that we learned about 1D spectra, uh, 1D proton spectra, and then move on to a couple other techniques that are other spectra that we will be discussing in the coming weeks, namely carbon spectra, and then the two types of correlation spectroscopy. Again, I will use ethyl crotonate as an example. I've updated my molecule viewer a little bit with some, uh, some additional features. First and foremost, we do have double bonds finally. So we see the, uh, uh, the ester as well as the, uh, the ethylene group or the, uh, uh, the double bond group there and there. And I've also added some labels. I want to highlight how I labeled these. If we take a look at one end, I call this carbon A, and then the hydrogens that are attached to carbon A are HA1, HA2, HA3, and then we continued on carbon B, carbon C, D, E, F, with the hydrogens labeled as appropriately. Just for completeness, I did label the oxygens. However, we won't be uh, seeing oxygens directly in the, uh, in the NMR spectrum. We have the 1D spectrum, uh, proton spectrum of ethyl crotonate. Just to review, we have one, two, three, four, five different types of uh, chemically equivalent hydrogens and they correspond to one, two, three, four, five different sets of, uh, of features in the NMR spectrum. The integrals, again, gave us the relative heights or the relative number of uh, hydrogens in each one of the groups. On the right-hand side, we have two features that integrate for three roughly three units each. Those correspond to our hydrogens on the methyl groups. We can differentiate between the two based on the splitting. The triplet is, arises from the ethyl group because there are, there are two nearest neighbors using the n plus one rule. That gives us a, a triplet. Whereas the feature at around 1.84 is a doublet or a doublet of doublets due to a uh, coupling to the HE and HD protons. The downfield part of the spectrum, we've got two features that integrate to roughly one proton each, corresponding to the E and the D protons. We can differentiate between these two by paying close attention to the coupling constants, and we were able to show that the, uh, uh, that the feature at 6.9 is due to HE, and then the feature at, uh, at 5.8 is due to HD. Okay, so now I would like to look at another 1D spectrum. But this time we will take a look at the carbon. Now, because carbon uh, spectra are uh, obtained on the carbon-13, which is, very, uh, is in very low abundance, there are special techniques that need to be run called, uh, um, uh, this is run under a decoupling uh, program. And what the decoupling does is uses some of the, uh, the magnetization from the proton um, to increase the signal to noise that we observe in the carbon. One of the problems with that is if we zoom into any one of these features, we see that all we're going to get are singlets for each one of the, uh, the, carbon, uh, the carbon signals. So we have lost not only our multiplicity, but it turns out that we've also lost any information from our integrals. So the tools that we use to interpret the NMR spectrum and the proton cannot be applied in the carbon. 
All that we're left with in carbon then is to really look at the chemical shifts. So let's take a look uh, at the general uh, chemical shifts that we observe in the carbon spectrum. And we want to look at, uh, sort of break this down into four different regions. The one region, high field, contain the saturated carbons, the sp3s, that are remote from any electronegative groups. And these show up in the range roughly 8 to 50-ish. When you add a, uh, an electronegative atom, such as oxygen, chlorine, or bromine, it shifts downfield a little bit, and we get uh, features in the range of around 45 to 80. A little bit further down, we start to get our sp2 carbons, including both uh, uh, rings and, uh, uh, and, and chains. And then finally, the fourth group are the carbonyls, which show up in the range between 155 and 220. In general, the feature that we want to observe here is this general downfield shift with increasing electronegativity. That's going to help us in determining the, uh, 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 or interpreting the, the carbon spectra. And if we know these, uh, these four different regions, then we will have enough information for a majority of the, uh, uh, the spectra that we're going to interpret in this class. So let's go back and take a look at our uh, carbon spectrum. That's that one right there. Now there are two peaks that we're going to ignore. This one right here at around 30, and this one here at around 205. Those are due to our solvent. And we're left with one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbon uh, signals corresponding to one, two, three, four, five, six. Six different hydrocarbons in our spectrum. Excellent. So if we take a look at the, uh, the upfield signals, we have one at 13 and one at 17. And if we recall from that, uh, uh, this chart here, we see that that falls very nicely in this range of saturated carbons. So let's take a look at where our saturated carbons are. We've got one, the F carbon is a CH3, and the A carbon is a CH3. So these two correspond most likely to these two peaks. And the question is, which one's which? If we look at the, uh, the more downfield peak, remember electronegativity in, is, results in a slight downfield shift. And we take a look at our, uh, our molecule here. And we see that A is closer to an oxygen, electronegative atom, than F is. So we might be able to suggest, this might suggest that the carbon, the A carbon, is the one that's more downfield. So we could tentatively assign the peak at 17 as carbon A, and then the peak at around 13.7 as carbon F. Let's go down to our uh, next one here. We have a peak that shows up at around 59, and that's somewhere around here. And this is a this looks like saturated carbons that are very close to an electronegative atom. Do we have any saturated carbons that are close to electronegative atoms? Sorry. We've got the one right here, carbon B. Carbon B, saturated carbon, right next to an oxygen, 60. I think we can safely say that the uh, peak at 59 is attributed to carbon B. Lastly, we've got this group of three peaks, 122, 144, and 165. If we go back, we see that two of those peaks lie in the region of 100 to 150, and that is consistent with the, uh, uh, with the double bonds. 
these two here are going to be due to carbons D and E. Again, we can use the same electronegativity arguments to differentiate D from E. If we take a look at our molecule, D is closer to the electronegative atoms than E is. So we can, uh, we can suggest, that suggests that the peak at 144 is carbon D and the peak at 122 is carbon E. We've assigned everything now except for carbon C and that is uh, the one at 165. This is consistent with the chart since it is the carbon that is next to a that uh, that takes part in a carbonyl, we also know that this carbon is uh, is one that has no hydrogens on it. And remember when I said that the carbon spectra are obtained by taking uh, advantage of the uh, the hydrogens connected to it to improve the signal to noise. Well, since this one doesn't have any hydrogens next to it, it can't take advantage of those signal to noise benefits. And so typically, these types of carbons, without any hydrogens bound to them, are going to show up as smaller signals in, uh, uh, in the spectrum. So there we have it. We've interpreted the carbon-13 spectrum of ethyl protonate. The things that we need to recall from interpreting carbon-13 uh, spectra, summary if you will, is that we lose the integral information and the multiplicity information because of the way that we collect the, uh, the spectra. The other thing that we re need to remember is that we can interpret the spectrum based on recalling the four different regions of the, spe of the carbon spectrum, saturated carbons, saturated carbons with electronegativity effects, sp2 carbons, and carbonyl carbons. And we can explain slight shifts in the carbon spectra due to electronegativity effects.